So, we're going to be dealing with a very familiar passage of Scripture this morning. It's uh, Romans chapter 12. We are continuing in our Real to Real uh, series. This is the fifth one. And this morning I'm using the first R-rated movie, although the clip I'm using from it is PG. I've made sure that it's PG, just in case. But I give you that warning. Uh, it's a war movie, and so war movies are notorious for uh, being fairly realistic uh, about what war is. That's why it's always supposed to be our last kind of option, uh, we hope. So, real people are E-E-L, real life, real answers, movies, media, all those kinds of things. And I want to show the contrast with real, R-E-A-L, real life and real answers. This morning, the movie we're using is Hacksaw Ridge, and for any of you that want to uh, read about the true story, um, there's a booklet out there, a small booklet, as well as two, um, two copies of um, the things about the movie that are not as real or the things that you might have thought weren't and actually are very real. Uh, it's Desmond Dawes, and in the Second World War, he uh, refused to bear arms, though he wanted to serve his country. So his designation at one point was a conscientious objector. He said, however, I'm not objecting to serve. I just don't want to carry a weapon. I, I consider myself a conscientious cooperator. And so he wanted to go to help his country because he felt like it was the right thing to do. And uh, so we move to, to Romans chapter 12. That's where we're going to take our lessons from. Oh, I hope that something didn't happen with the, with the, um, the font. I already see that there's a problem. Uh, mm, that's a problem when it all messes up because the things I want you to see don't always happen. Some of them will be off the edge and some of them will be off, off the bottom. I don't like to see that. Okay, the title this morning, the subtitle for us is The Living Sacrifice. And that comes from Romans chapter... 12 verses 1, uh, verse, verse 1 specifically, but verses 1 and 2 as we move into this. I'm going to actually start this morning with the clip. The first clip, I want to give you, I want to give you just a little setup for these two clips. They'll play back to back. But the first clip, and David, I want to make sure that we have plenty of volume because he starts off speaking very softly. I um, but it doesn't remain soft. In the first clip, um, he, he keeps saying, Lord, I can't hear your voice. And then he hears someone injured, and so he goes to help him. You hear him say over and over, Lord, help me get just one more. Help me say just one more. Uh, the story is true. Um, Desmond himself, when he came back from, from this said, I think I probably saved 50 people. His commanding officer said it was more like 100, but in order for the, for the um, Medal of Honor that he received, uh, they compromised on 75. 75 men that would not have seen the rest of their days had he not stayed there on this ridge, very difficult place in Okinawa to defend, but a place they had to take in order to uh, defeat the Empire of Japan. Um, the second clip, there's a, a little more light in the second one than there is in the first one as far as brightness. So, Ed, it would probably be good if we turned off all the lights on the platform as we begin. And you can turn them back on as we get through that second clip. But um, this all takes place, this particular clip, it's not the only episode in his wartime career, but... This all takes place in one afternoon night into the dawn of the next day. And the second clip ends with the, uh, the ending of that dawn. Think about the living sacrifice as you uh, look at this story that Hollywood used. Um, they did adjust a few things in it, not in this, these particular clips, but see what the Lord brings to your heart as you... Uh, do that, and as we start with Romans chapter 12. Romans 12 begins, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies 
a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We'll read the rest of it here in just a few moments. Living sacrifices. I will tell you that uh, the same... <laughs> The same director that directed The Passion of the Christ directed this, and he actually cut out something here uh, that would have happened at that point because he said it seemed so unbelievable. He was actually shot in the leg, and he was shot in the arm, which fractured his arm, which made him uh, uh, unable to hold down a regular job the rest of his life. But um, even Mel Gibson, who directed it, said that it seemed so far-fetched for moviegoers to look at, and yet that was the actual case. God calls us through Paul's letter here to the Romans to become living sacrifices, wholly acceptable to him. And the reason I use this hopefully is obvious because he was willing to sacrifice himself not to go and shoot people, but to go and rescue people. Uh, most of the people, the guys in his company, did not want him to be part of their company at first because he was not willing to carry a gun, and they thought, he won't be any help to me, he won't be able to protect me, and all of that. And yet he showed by his character. He was a Seventh-day Adventist, and because of his religious beliefs, uh, he did not carry a gun. And there's a scene in the movie that is true, uh, that the final assault, which took place the next day on this ridge, resulting in the fact that they actually took the ridge, and eventually the island of Okinawa, um, <coughs> It was a Saturday that they were getting ready to do that for Seventh-day Adventist. They, they recognize Sabbath, Saturday as the Sabbath, and so they had a, he would not go uh, with them until, uh, until they had a, they'd had a prayer uh, with, before they went into the battle, and the commanding officer was willing to do that and said, we are willing to stop and pause it all and up the chain of command, down, down the chain of command until uh, they said, yes, we can do that. So, a living sacrifice. Now, Jesus is not calling us to carry weapons and go out into the world or be shot, necessarily. Though all of those things are true in one respect or another in the world in which we have lived as Christians. The first quote I have here is from Ralph P. Martin in his commentary, and he says, The righteousness of God accepted by the believer is an inward experience which must have an outward expression. Being a Christian is not about making an ethical, moral choice in our mind that does not affect our living. This choice has to affect the way we live. We express outwardly what God has done through His righteousness imparted to us who are sinners. This righteousness that He has given us results in an expression of our faith in Him and willingness to do what He calls us to do. He continues, The Christian view of the body as sacred and as the servant of the soul is unique <laughs> among the religions of the world. Judaism accepted so of all the religions of the world, Judaism and Christianity, that is a continuation of uh, Judaism from the Old Testament, are the only world religions that says that this physical body has a purpose. And it is to be used for His honor and for His glory under the direction of our eternal soul. Because for so many, they say, well, the body is bad, the body is evil, and so um, Gnosticism and some other, uh, some other things that grew out of, uh, out of this thought have warped a lot of people's opinion that you know, somehow this body can never be made uh, to be in subjection to the Almighty God and to His Holy Spirit. And yet for the Christian, we believe that yes, this body that we live in now, in this place, can be used for God's glory and honor. It is not just kind of a throwaway that is merely a shell of, uh, that we have to carry around with us. William Greathouse, one of the, eventually one of the general superintendents of the Church of the Nazarene, but he was a theologian, 
uh, first. In the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, he says, the righteousness of God has invaded this present evil age, which lingers still to inaugurate already the new age. In other words, there is something that happens in the Christian's life, the Christian's life that once we have received Christ as our Savior, His salvation for our sins, we begin eternity. Now, we know that we live the rest of our life and we will pass away and we will go to heaven with Jesus. But that begins for the Christian when we begin to walk with Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. But I thought the words were interesting. The righteousness of God has invaded this present evil age. Do you wonder why the world struggles with Christians? We're invaders. The thing that we were talking about this morning at praise team practice after after our prayer time, and Michael alluded to that, and David alluded to it in his um, in his testimony. The headlines that the world gives us, yes, the headlines are uh, are bad because bad news sells. There's a reason that bad news sells. Because bad news makes us feel better about ourselves. At least I'm not like a them. Good news doesn't sell as much because good news says there's something I can be, I can do, I can move beyond. And so unless we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, good news makes us feel guilty. Because we haven't gotten there yet. So, yes, we're invaders in this world because we are followers of Jesus Christ. Believers must steadfastly resist the pressures of this present age to conform them to the pattern of this world, which is already passing away. This world isn't going to last. We know that. God's Word is clear on that. This world isn't going to last. But we're called to live in the present world, conform to the pattern of Christ, not the pattern of the world. The yielding of the life in holy living is well-pleasing to God. Believers are to act decisively, making themselves totally available for ongoing service as God's weapons in the apocalyptic struggle against the entrenched forces of evil still resistant to his rule. Tidbit of information, that ridge wasn't just a small mountain, it actually was almost the entire width of the island. The Japanese had occupied that island for years and they had tunneled through that mountain in such a way that there were places they could pop up all through that. There were places that their forces could be entrenched and until they were routed from that, they held this very important island, which was not too far from Japan, which the Allied forces needed in order to get to Japan. Well, the entrenched forces of evil have had more than just a few years to entrench in this world society, to, be, to get their talons at times into every part of our society. Fifty years ago, People could say, I go to church. People could say, my pastor prays at our football games. People could say that we heard on the uh, intercom system at our high school a prayer and a Bible verse. People could say things like that. They could even say that abortion on demand is not legal in our country. In my lifetime, so many of these things have become different. As the world now says, you can say anything you want to except things about Jesus. In your schools, if you want to talk about witchcraft, that's okay. Just don't bring Jesus into it because that's religion. And we're supposed to be separated from that. The interesting thing is that it's become so entrenched in our society that even as Christians, we start to say, well, maybe I shouldn't, maybe I shouldn't, maybe it's wrong for me to say, maybe it's wrong. 
when the reality is we need to speak as Christians in love. We need to speak the truth in love in this world. This is the world where Jesus has placed us and said, I want you to be my witnesses in this world. I want you to be a living sacrifice to me. And so often in this day and age, we tend to say, oh, but what will that cost me? Well, verse 1 is pretty clear. Everything. What can I hold back? Nothing. And there are some places in our world where brothers and sisters in Christ are doing exactly that, giving their very life to say, I have to stand up for Jesus. God desires to embrace the whole of our daily lives, not just the interruptions in our routine set apart for activities at the place of worship. I thought that was an interesting way to put that too. Too many people are satisfied with these little interruptions we call worship services or these little interruptions we call revival or these little interruptions. And we say, well, that's enough Christianity for my week. Now I can go and live. Because I've checked it off of my list. That's not what God desires. He wants all of us. He wants all of our living, all of our day, everything about us. This first section is the largest section, just in case you're wondering. Worship is not merely a matter of taste. It's the true test of whether we understand the difference between right and wrong. Oh, we go to that, that new church. They've got this new, wow, it's so much fun. It's so much fun. We get to go there and we do fun things and it's all exciting. But do you hear the truth of God? I really have no intention of offending anyone today. But wherever, whenever their service starts... Pastor Olstein will stand before a large crowd of people and tell them that God just wants great things in their life and to just pour out blessings on them. Material blessings. Not just His presence in the midst of difficulty, but God doesn't want you to have difficulty. And people will say, Yay, I love this kind of religion. Christians present themselves to God as individuals, but their sacrificial offering is a community project. It caused me to pause when I read this. We can't really offer ourselves as sacrifices, as living sacrifices to God, except in the community of believers. And part of what that means is that we do it together, but we also support one another. Because occasionally we'll come across someone that is fanatical to the point of being crazy. But if the body praying, committed to Jesus Christ says, hold up. Then the body together should be able to make those decisions. Not the body that is worried about whether our worship is my taste or whether I go somewhere to hear wonderful things that just kind of keep me floating on clouds, but if the truth is being preached and if the people are following after Christ, they are the body of Christ. And this is the community that says, yes, let's do this together in our world. One cannot be holy alone, Greg House says. Holiness is experienced only within the context of a holy church. More specifically, a particular local community of believers. Amen. I've heard all my life people say, oh, I can serve God just fine, never go to church. I go out fishing and I talk to God and we have a great time together. It's funny though, because in church, in the local community of believers, we have to live our holiness. 
Our holiness says we rub elbows with each other. People that are different. People that have different opinions. People that do things differently. And we rub shoulders with them. And God says, yeah, because that's the working out of your holiness. Great House continues, apparently communal cooperation is called for. It is not called rugged individualism. You are, you all are involved. Sanctification is not a solo performance. It demands a choir, an orchestra, a community of saints. John Wesley says, holy solitaries is a phrase no more consistent with the gospel than holy adulterers. The gospel of Christ knows no religion but social, no holiness but social holiness. Faith working by love is the length and breadth and depth and height of Christian perfection. Faith working by love. We're not talking about cerebral things here. That we come to faith in Christ as a decision that we made in our brain and we just kind of keep it in there. It works through every part of us to show His holy power at work in His people. Now move with me to 3 through 8. Like I said, that first section was the longest. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another, having then gifts, differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. In other words, because we are part of the body of Christ, we are all different, but God calls us to use our gifts and talents, our personalities, and all of that together for his glory. Realizing that people don't have to be just like me. That we can be like the leaders. All of those working together to build what needs to be built. Talents which come from God, Martin says, ought to be used with humility. He who is specially endowed is tempted to fancy himself and become self-important. Hence the apostle warns that such such must take himself seriously and avoid conceit. Pay attention to who you really are. You know. The effectiveness of our gifts depends on how completely we depend on God. Not on our own human resources for the performing of our ministry, whatever it may be. Make sure your brain pauses there for a moment. The effectiveness of the gifts doesn't depend on how much you practice. The effectiveness of the gift doesn't depend on how clever you are. The effectiveness of the gift depends on how completely you depend on God. Yes. Yes. Right. Come on. Ouch. Yep. Too often we depend too much on our own ingenuity and not enough on divine empowering. And I find this interesting, spoken by a theologian whose words, this section is like 45 pages long in his commentary, and it's a little difficult to follow at times. Too often we depend too much on our own ingenuity and not enough on divine empowering of the Almighty. Ministry must be the corporate task of the entire body of Christ gifted to serve in His behalf. So who's supposed to be about the ministry business? The whole body? Move to verse 9. We'll read to the end. 
Let love be without dissimulation or hypocrisy. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave or hold fast to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love and honor, preferring one another or putting someone else ahead of you. Not slothful or lazy in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing or giving to the necessity or the needs of the saints, given to hospitality, bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not, rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things that condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt keep coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. We'll take these last two sections. The first part of it is the law of love that's expressed. Love is genuine, pure, sincere. Love produces loathing of evil and hungering after good. Love honors fellow Christians above yourself. <clears throat> Love is not lazy in business. Love does not wane in enthusiasm for serving the Lord. Well, it's been a long time. It's time for me to retire. God doesn't have a retirement plan except for the, oh, that's the last breath, and we have a retirement. <laughs> Love rejoices in the reality of Christian hope. This is inside the Christian community. Love patiently endures suffering. Love perseveres in prayer. Love gives to the needs of fellow believers. Love practices hospitality. And then he tells us how to live wisely in the world, even under the pressure of the world. Bless those who persecute you. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with others or mind the same things. Be about the same things as one another. Beware of self-conceit. Never repay evil for evil. Live in peace with all as much as it is possible from your part. Leave wrath and vengeance to God. Treat your enemy kindly. Overcome evil with Good. The definitive mark of Christianity, of Christian spirituality, is love. Without it, all else Christians say or do is an irrelevant caricature of the Christian ethic. Without love, we're us tinkling brass, sounding simple. David, we love you as the drummer, but if that's the only accompaniment we had, it would be a little difficult to follow the tune. Because that's just sound with no direction. And that's, what, that's what Jesus says, that it'll be through his word. If we don't really have love, just be like noise. This is Wesley's defense. Wesley, John Wesley was an Anglican minister, the Church of England. He was an Anglican minister, and the bishops um, came down pretty hard on him for preaching about heart holiness um, and the fact that we should be holy people because that's what the Bible says over and over and over. And so he took something that's actually from their own, their own performance of... The communion, the, the Eucharist celebration, the breaking of bread and wine, drinking of wine. And the response was interesting from his bishop. He said, if this is what you mean by holiness, then preach it all you want. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name through Christ our Lord. That's what it's about. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Know my thoughts. And make me a living sacrifice worked out daily in the midst of real people and real life. R-E-A-L. When Desmond Dawes 
was on that ridge. The order was given to retreat because they couldn't take it. And they already had so many injuries and casualties. And so they retreated, except for the wounded and Desmond Doss. And in that first part of the clip, just where do you want me? I don't understand. I can't hear your voice. Until an injured man says, help me. And it's like we hear the words of Jesus when you've done it to the least of these. Lord, when did we see you thirsty and offer you a drink? Or when did we see you hurt or unclothed and offer you these things? When did we do that for you? And he says, when you did it for the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. So he said, as far as I can go, as much as I can do, Lord, help me get one more. It is an amazing account of how God used a young man with very little education. And you can hear it in his, uh, he speaks later on in his 60s about this and still got the same accent, the same um, grammar and things that he'd learned as a, as a child and as a young man. But you can hear in that the willingness to say, Lord, I want you to use my life however you want to use it for your glory and for your honor. That's what Paul is calling us to. That's what we're being called to, is to be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, whether it's on a battlefield or whether it's on a battlefield. See, the enemy is roaming around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, and that's not just us, that's Others, too, those who show up in headlines in newspapers or on those lists in the back part that says these people are now facing jail time or prison time. Jesus took the sins of the whole world on himself. And it is up to those who know what he's done to go into the world and say he's done this for me and he wants to do it for you. Oh, you've got to be kidding. You're crazy. You're out of your mind. People told Desmond that he was a coward because he wasn't willing to take a gun into battle. Interestingly enough, he was willing to go into battle with no weapon at all so he could save lives. And he felt that was his calling. What does it mean in your life to be a living sacrifice for Jesus' honor and glory. Stand together.